And happy Tuesday, NCAA basketball fans. This is your weekly Trogcast, two really old guys talking about NCAA basketball. Jeff Zink on this end and joining me, as he always does, Jim Reeker on the other. Jim, what's happening in your uh, part of the world? Well, it's still January, but we've almost survived January, Jeff, and you know what comes after January. February? Yeah, and then we know what comes after February. Well, is that what you're really pointing to, March Madness? March Madness, yeah, but we got we got about four weeks and uh, the a lot uh, of race, basketball race, left before then. Races are starting to heat up or trying to sort themselves out, and uh, looks like we're starting to get an idea who the best teams in the country might be. Well, I, I agree with you that some, some of that, but we still got the, the wackiness. Not as wacky as it's been in the past few weeks, but last week. Uh, you know, I, I talked about you know, going back two weeks and the number of losses that the the top 25 took. Uh, it wasn't as bad last week, but what, what points out to me is um, last week there were five home losses to lower-ranked teams by teams in the top 25, which sends up a, a bit of a, a flare to me. You know, and those were uh, Nevada, uh, known as Arizona State, lost to to Utah. At home, Florida lost to the Southern, but South Carolina at home. Um, North Carolina, and what turned out to be a great game, lost to North Carolina State at home. They've become dragon killers. Ohio State loses to Penn State at home on a thrilling last-second shot, and uh, West Virginia losing to Kentucky at home. So, you know, Kentucky not that big of a surprise. We knew they were going to poke their head back up. But it seems like home court advantage isn't really holding like it has in the past. Well, and I know it's early in the uh, broadcast here, but uh, just a little uh, trivia I picked up last night. See if you know this or uh, you heard this. Uh, on Saturday, North Carolina and Duke both lost at home, as you pointed out. Do you know the last time that happened? On the same day, you mean? On the same day, yeah. Yeah, I, got, I, just, I don't know that it's ever happened. 1973 was the last mm-hmm. time that North Carolina and Duke lost at home on the same day. 1973. Richard Nixon mm-hmm. was still president. <laughs> but heading out the door, but still president. Yeah, and, and you know, and the Duke loss. I mean, well, we're going to talk about Virginia here in a little bit. I mean, by two at at home, uh, two versus four. That was a great game. Went right down to the end. And North Carolina, North Carolina State. You just never know what's going to happen when they play each other. And North Carolina has already defeated a, a couple of number twos, uh, Arizona and Duke, when they were number two. So I got to watch out if they got to play Virginia again. But um, it just—I yeah, mean—I go back to the, the point that it used to be: you, you always held court at home, and, and these upsets were happening on the road. But it seems like more and more of these are happening uh, wherever they're playing. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, well, here I'll throw another trivia at you. I mean, Duke—you can name. Two or three players, probably starters for Duke, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Everybody knows Grayson Allen, uh, Marvin Bagley, Gary Trent Jr. Can you name a starter for the Virginia Cavaliers? Uh, Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett always gets them started. Well, no that's, doubt about uh, that. <laughs> again, and, and you, you bring up the point that I was going to make is uh, it's uh, Tony Bennett is really showing what a coach he is. Of course, that uh, Virginia team is kind of based on. Uh, slowing the pace down and playing defense, much as Bo Ryan used to do at Wisconsin. And uh, you have to give a lot of accolades to the Cavaliers' success, to Tony Bennett. Uh, in fact, I, I read somewhere that in his, I think this is fifth or sixth year there, <clears throat> he has not had a top 20 recruit, nor has he had anyone who went in the top 20 to the NBA draft. So it just shows that uh, what, what the job he's doing and uh, – how his uh, success is, uh, you know, just continuing at kind of kind of quietly at Virginia. Again, you, you can talk about Villanova, you can talk about Purdue, some of the other teams up there, and you can name, you know, top stars for the team. And uh, I had to look it up who, who their leading scorer was. I guess, uh, kind of uh, fittingly, his name is Kyle Guy, so he's just a guy, and yeah. uh, 
He's so only averaging talk- 15 points a game. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about the, you know, the discussion here in a minute. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to it. I just wanted, before we get, went to that, we'll transition right into it. The thing we forgot to do last week was uh, to bet on the, the Big 12 SEC Challenge, which is last Saturday. So I won't make you okay. me an ice cream I'll, Sunday or a favorite cold beverage because the SEC won 6-4. Oh, I don't decide that that we're not going to do that this year? (laughs) It was last week. We forgot to to, to lay the bed. I know. uh, So I I want to make the post decision not to take the bet this year. Yeah, I know. It's it's a lot. Very easy. Very easy to do that. If you'd have won, there would have been a little retroactive going there. But you bring up uh, another topic when you talk about Tony Bennett in Virginia, Um, you know, and you talk about the cream rising to the top. Uh, you know, right now the, the discussion seems to be, you know, who's the legitimate number one, and you can pick between three different teams. You've been touting Purdue all year. They finally got a vote for number one in last week's um, uh, a poll. You know, they've won 17 straight. They're 10 and 0 in the Big Ten plus four, three and 0 against top 25 teams. Um, you've got Virginia, which you know, we were talking about the the Duke win, and everybody knows how hard it is to go into Cameron Indoor and win anyway, but they also held Clemson to just 36 points in the game before that. They're they're built to last. Their only loss is to West Virginia earlier in the year, and of course Villanova, which holds that number one rank, their only loss is to Butler at Butler. Um, Unfortunately, they just lost Phil Booth, which might factor in the and two big games coming up might be that Purdue-Michigan State game on February 5th, just coming up here in the next week um, against Michigan State. And, of course, Nova has to travel to Xavier on February 17th, getting a little ahead of ourselves. But looking at that, and the hard part about this, is because there aren't a lot of crossover games now, it's all in conference, should we be rethinking uh, positions at the top? And, and also within that, mentioning a couple of teams like Duke, you know, just barely losing to Virginia is probably still in discussion like they've been most of the year, and Michigan State sort of looming there in the top five. Yeah, and uh, you're right, uh, you know, uh, and again, to, to reiterate, the top three went, into, went on the road and won. Not only did they go on the road and win, all three of them went into very hostile environments. Villanova went to Marquette on Sunday, pulled out an 85-82 win. And if you remember, Marquette beat them in Milwaukee last year when they were ranked number one. And, again, the I watched that game. Uh, the crowd was, you know, out of the world. They were loud and trying to get the uh, Golden Eagles going and actually did spur two runs, one in the first half, one in the second half, where they – either got very close or took the lead, but uh, Villanova was able to uh, weather the storm and come out with a win. Virginia, we don't even have to talk about Cameron Indoor, what a tough environment that is. It's always been a tough environment. And they go there and win. And and Purdue, not a a highly regarded Indiana team, kind of a middle-of-the-road Big Ten team, but again, rivalry game within the state. It was at Indiana. And again, I watched that game. The Indiana fans were, you know, right there to – uh, cheer their Hoosiers on, and actually the Hoosiers early on built a double-digit lead, but Purdue uh, uh, stayed the course, uh, weathered the storm, and came back and won 74-67. So all three of those teams, it's hard to separate them. They they had big challenges, and they all uh, uh, won those big challenges. And then you look just a little bit down further, Michigan State had the same thing, went to Maryland, got down double digits, but were able to pull out the win. And last night, Kansas went to Kansas State, a team that, uh, took them all the way to the buzzer, had a shot right at the buzzer, would have won at Kansas if it went in, but it, it bounced off the rim. But uh, the Jayhawks were able to easily dispose of uh, the Wildcats at Kansas State last night before another raucous crowd. So uh, we see some teams at the top starting to kind of gel and be able to take on some big challenges, even though they're on the road with rivals and in front of raucous crowds. Mm-hmm. Well, if you had a vote right now, uh, you know, would you keep Nova at the top? I mean, you've been touting Purdue heavy, and you know, you're just talking about the, the great job that Tony Bennett has done. Would you would you keep it in the one, two, three order that it is, um, or or might you uh, rearrange that? Well, and I, I've heard other. This isn't just my opinion, but uh, I think it very holds true. Uh, one of the things I think you see in college basketball is you don't see. Uh, the great big men anymore. 
Uh, Villanova, their their biggest starter is a freshman, uh, not highly touted. He's, he's a good player. Uh, Virginia, again, I don't even know. I haven't watched them that much, but uh, Purdue has the big men. They have a uh, a seven three center who's replaced by a seven two center. So they have the inside game. Somebody they can go to down low when shots aren't falling. Somebody who's a a rim defender. So, uh, you know, would I would I make the Boilermakers the number one? Well, they'll know it's sitting there, and it's kind of tradition until you lose a game that uh, you're not going to be removed. Although I will say, as we talked about, I think a little bit last week, or it may not have happened yet, that Phil Booth broke his hand for the Villanova Wildcats, and uh, they were a little thin anyway. They didn't go real deep, and now with another player out to an injury, you know, uh, that might, uh, that short bench might might creep up and get them. Uh, Purdue, they, yeah, again, they got two starting in early February. They got to play Ohio State and Michigan State. Uh, back to back, so that's going to be a big challenge for them. But uh, I guess I would. I, what you're asking is Purdue the best team in my mind right now. I would probably say yes. Although uh, again, Virginia, they're different. They're, they're they're so different because they do play great defense, and that's something I think this whole season you could say is a theme. Is I don't know if teams play uh, great defense. It's become almost an offensive. Uh, offensive period of college basketball. A lot of the fast breaks and transition uh, is the way teams go and shooting the three-pointers and getting up a lot of shots, almost trending toward an NBA style as we uh, move forward in uh, college basketball history. So so I, to answer your question, I didn't answer your question. No, oh, I, I was going to say, I, I didn't expect you to. You usually diplomatically swerve around there, but that's okay. But it should be interesting to, to see as we go. Like I say, we've got uh, – February the 5th, which is just uh, uh, less than a week away, where we should have a top five matchup between uh, Michigan State and Purdue. And then uh, if everything holds court, a a little over uh, two weeks later, Xavier and Villanova might be in a position to have a a top five matchup. And I think those might be the ones that decide who's going to be on top of those respective divisions. And, and other things going on, too. Arizona has crept back into the top ten. They've slowly come up from their three-loss uh, tournament debacle, and they keep going back. They revenge their loss to, to Colorado as well now. Um, like I say, the, the cream is coming up there, and it's going to be interesting to see where we go from there. Um, unfortunately, also this week, a couple of, a sad notes when it comes to storied programs. <clears throat> I'm talking about the first one, which would be a little easier, which is that uh, Coach Ollie and the Yukon Huskies are under investigation for recruiting violations. Um, and we haven't really heard much on, on these sorts of fronts after everything that went on with the, the preseason with uh, the FBI investigation. Uh, but an outside agency is going to be uh, investigating the coach. And, and this, if something comes out about this, this could very well be the end of his reign because Coach Holly, even though he has won uh, NCAA championship, he hasn't really done much with that UConn program since that win. Yeah, and again, as you mentioned, it started out, we thought maybe this was going to be the big story of the season, investigations with the FBI, of course, uh, making their uh, report in, back in September, and it kind of affected the Louisville, Arizona, Auburn, and Oklahoma State, I think, were the main four that were mentioned in that report. And we thought, oh, this might be a bad uh, Omen for college basketball, we haven't heard much or anything from the FBI. And now, of course, yeah, you have this uh, coming from the NCAA on UConn. So, uh, yeah, that, it's hard to say. Yeah, they've, they've kind of fallen down to a mid-range uh, team in the AAC uh, after being such a big power in the uh, old Big East for a long time. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. You just hate to see this, but uh, it is the reality of the world these days. <laughs> well, like I say, it could, could very well be if something turns up and, and Coach Kevin Ollie is involved, he's, he's in a sixth coach and uh, just the second year of a five-year, $17, 18000000 million extension, but that can be uh, avoided for 
just cause, and the Muskies are only, uh, excuse me, the Muskies, the Huskies are only sitting at 11 and 9, and they had a losing season last year, so it could be um, dangerous times for him, but that that whole thing kind of pales in comparison to the news coming out of East Lansing and the, the, the continued news at Michigan State, most of this coming as a, a carryover from the Dr. Larry Nasser debacle with uh, USOC and US Gymnastics, and that's been all over the news with the you know, now almost turning into the hundreds of young women that he abused in his tenure as the team doctor for USA Gymnastics and being housed at Michigan State. But that's also led to quite uh, an investigation into Michigan State athletics and what's happened with um, allegations against athletes there just in the the past week or so. You know, the, the president of the university has decided to resign to help the university move on. That was Luann Simon and the AD, Mark Hollis, who was part of it for most of it, um, uh, decided to retire. And he's been accused of having, you know, direct knowledge of sexual assaults, which he decided to handle in-house rather than going out. And the dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine, William Stemple, also decided to step down. And they've also released the gymnastics coach, Kathy Cleggies, who was uh, on suspension due to these, but it goes even deeper because uh, now it's reflecting on the football coach, Mark D'Antoni, and uh, basketball coach, Tom Isso, and, and the word you keep hearing over and over is transparency or you know, lack thereof, that the athletic department and university officials have not been transparent in their investigation involving athletes, especially when it comes to sexual assault on campus. Yeah, and uh, you would think uh, if I had said, uh, ask you a few weeks ago how long did Tom Izzo uh, be the coach at Michigan State, and you would probably answer as long as he wants to be. And uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, I think there's a dark shadow hanging over that entire university, and um, I think you know Tom, Tom Izzo's days might be numbered too, uh, as we've seen through other. Uh, different things throughout the country this year that uh, these stories are taken seriously and uh, a lot of people, major people have met their downfall in their careers because of things like this. And, you know, there's been incidents named ESPN, of course, did the major uh, report uh, expose on uh, Michigan state and uh, named Izzo and D'Antoni of having knowledge of some things that have gone on with their players and named those players. So it's, it's not just a, uh, you know, maybe it's, you know, there are facts out there that things did happen and maybe weren't taken care of properly. And, again, it's going to come down to how responsible were these coaches. And uh, it'll be interesting to see. It, it might be a sad, sad uh, end to a great career, but much in the uh, light of, you know, what happened with Joe Paterno at mm -hmm. uh, Penn State. Uh, was he directly involved in the situation, we don't think so, but because of his lack of uh, not knowing or not taking care of business in these situations, you know, led to uh, his downfall. So it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be a major distraction for Michigan State, which uh, you know, on the basketball court, which is a team uh, early on, I think they were ranked number one to start the season. They've been up in the top uh, four or five, it seems like, the whole season, but it's uh, – it's going to be, I think, tough for them to remain focused. But you never know. Maybe it will bring a team together, and we'll see how they uh, uh, finish out this season. Well, it's, uh, you bring a good point there for the basketball team. It could be something that would become a major distraction because even a former assistant coach has been uh, accused of things and being on the sideline when they made a Final Four run a few years back. Uh, but it could also be a rallying cry, as Tom has always said, they want to be there for the survivors, but the, the whole thing, it, 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 it smacks of the, the, the way things have been handled uh, way too often that, uh, you know, you look at the Nasser case, uh, reports were given to Michigan State as early as 1997, but they not only failed to open a formal investigation until 2014, I mean, 17 years later. That's, that's incredible. Uh, 
but Michigan State also failed to report any Title IX violations, which is what you have to do under some sort of sexual assault and in-house investigations to federal authorities because Title IX is a, a federal situation. Um, this, you know, it's it's where they tried to handle it in-house and didn't do it. I mean, when you look at it, you know, one of the accusations against Coach D'Antoni is that. You know, there are facts that there were 16 football players accused of sexual assault, but just last June he denied knowledge of any of that. But he also quickly dismissed four players this last spring from the team and the university when uh, an accusation came up. The the biggest thing that, that is troubling to me, Jim, is that there continues to be... You know, what seems to be a cover-up. Michigan State was asked for records. They didacted the records and kept out names, even though they're required to do that. Things were handled in the house. One of the most shocking things is that once Coach D'Antoni uh, talked to a player who had been accused of sexual assault, and his punishment was he had to sit down and talk to his mother about what he had done. Um, you know, just hiding everything in-house. This is, I, I really think this is going to blow up on the Spartans. I don't know how much of it's going to splatter against Coach Izzo and Coach D'Antoni, but I really think this is going to get very, very ugly before it's resolved. And you bring up a, a case to compare it to, which is the Paterno case at Penn State. If Michigan State doesn't come right out and just say, we're, we're going to give the federal authorities everything we know, especially with a new president and new AD coming in and a chance to do that, this is going to get very, very ugly for a very storied athletic program yeah I, I agree and again uh is not what we want to be talking about uh when we talk about college basketball but again like i said uh you know with the harry weinstein and everything and everybody that's you know it's almost like uh you know you, you got to say well at least uh, you know these things are being dealt with now but unfortunately for many many years they have not been dealt with and things have gone on and all uh all businesses and different throughout the country. So uh, college basketball being affected uh, shouldn't be a surprise, I don't think. Well, it's uh, I mean, it's not a great book, but it's uh, a very good book. If you ever want to see how difficult this is, uh, read John Krakauer's Missoula. Um, John Krakauer, known for Into Thin Air and Into the Woods, has been a beat writer for many things, but... Uh, this deals with the, a rape. It, it deals with the University of Montana and how they handled some of those and just how difficult it is to to deal with some of these. One of the biggest problems, Jim, before we move on, is that a lot of universities handle these things in-house and don't turn them over to the authorities and um, decisions are made. And, and Missoula does a great job of walking through several cases against um, high-profile athletes and how they turned by the way the university handled it and, and when the, uh, the young women ended up going to the authorities, uh, how it shaped their lives. And uh, I just hope that, uh, like I said before, that the, the Spartans can come through and, and open up, make things a little more transparent and less opaque and, and get through this. But this, like the FBI thing, which we haven't heard much of in the, in the past few weeks, is something that's going to be there for at least through uh, this year's March Madness, no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, who, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, we hope it doesn't taint that uh, great uh, celebration that this country has every March. Uh, but if it does, because it needs to, then it, it will. And, uh, again, I think the uh, institution of college basketball is, uh, w will survive as, you know, college football did with uh, the uh, Penn State problem a, a few years ago and Joe Paterno, you know, and that program has uh, gradually bounced back. But, yeah, I agree. I think, uh, I, you know, I can't say whether Tom Izzo will even be there at the end of this season. I mean, the president's gone, the AD's gone, uh, you know, they're knocking at his door now. And uh, I do think Tom Izzo is probably a fighter, but uh, at some point he may have to say, 
uh, for everybody involved, it's best that I leave. Or And, uh, again, D'Antonio, the uh, football coach, may have to make the same decision, but only time will tell in those, those situations. Yeah, we'll let it, let it work its way through because, uh, well, you know, one of the issues, and unfortunately doesn't always happen with educators, is through the, the federal process you are innocent until proven guilty, whereas in some of these in-house uh, investigations you you have to prove you're innocent. Um, so it might work out in the coaches' favor. We, we hope that everything turns out well for everybody involved, not just the coaches, but the, the young ladies and the athletes who, who may have also been falsely accused, but if they have perpetrated these crimes, that they be brought to justice and to be done properly. Um, I'm sure this isn't the last time we'll have to mention this at one point or another, but let's uh, move along from sad thoughts into back to basketball. Um, the week, when we look at the week to come, there aren't really a lot of, of big matchups. There's not a lot of top 25 matchups at all. In fact, the big one, we're going to have to wait until next Monday. That's when Oklahoma goes to West Virginia, and both of those are sort of taking it on the chin. So that's going to be a very important one for uh, the standings in the, the Big 12. Uh, so we'll, we'll start with that, and then we'll get to some of the more intriguing matchups as we go through, because right now you know, Kansas is still at the top. We, we said Oklahoma needed that win, and they got it. And then you've got Texas Tech, West Virginia, and Oklahoma all sitting at 5-3, and three, uh, which is a game and a half behind uh, the Jayhawks. So is this, you know, uh, a must win if you want to have any hope of dethroning Kansas in the Big 12 next Monday. Well, we talked about before that this might, because of some injuries and uh, things that happen, uh, Billy Preston, who now is not going to play for Kansas, he actually signed a professional contract, I think, in Lithuania. So that situation where they were waiting on him to maybe come back from a suspension. Um, you know, I, I picked the West Virginia Mountaineers to win that, and of course they've fallen on hard times. And uh, uh, I guess you just shouldn't bet against uh, Bill Self. He said that this is not one of his best teams, but they continually uh, win big games. They went into West Virginia and uh, won that that game last week, or I think it's about a week ago. They uh, again last night went to Kansas State and won that big game. Uh, he just he's just showing again. Uh, kind of like Tony Bennett, that uh, I, I have a friend when he talks about uh, sports, he has a saying, coaching matters. And I think that is true in, in this case. Uh, big game Good. tomorrow night that I see uh, actually in your, one of your conferences, uh, maybe not on the national radar, but if you look at the standings, it's a pretty big game, I think, is Louisville visits Virginia. And if Virginia mm-hmm. can uh, beat the Cardinals, that pretty much gives them a uh, a very commanding lead in the uh, ACC, and uh, it'd be hard to bet that anyone could come back and overtake the Cavaliers for the ACC regular season uh, championship. And yeah, there's a, what is there's three teams I believe that are still a game, three or four that are still a game within the Jayhawks. But uh, I, I again, they they just uh, they seem to be kind of uh, catching, you know, getting getting in, figuring each other out, and figuring out ways to win with uh, what they have. And uh, they're very uh, they're very thin down low, too. Azabuke, their big man underneath. When he gets in foul trouble, which he did last night, uh, they're going to a guy who has a guy named Lightfoot who has not logged many minutes. He's been there a few years. Uh, but he's had to uh, step in and play some important minutes, and he has done that. So hats off to uh, uh, Bill Self. And then uh, a big... Here, here's I was going to mention this earlier. Coming up, and I've talked about this before, and I just I can't see how they can survive it, especially as thin they are. But Villanova, they play their next four games at home, and then they go on the road four out of five games against some of the other Big East powers. I cannot see them going through that second stretch uh, without a loss or two, uh, just because, again, they are very thin now with uh, the loss of Phil Booth. And, again, they're very, very talented, the five guys they put out there, but they just don't have a whole lot uh, to give them uh, relief. And I think uh, through February, the dog days of college basketball, especially when they're going to be traveling four out of those five days, uh, I think that they're four out of those five games, I think they're going to get wore down a little bit. And so uh, 
Uh, of the top three, Villanova, Virginia, and Purdue, I see Villanova stumbling a little bit before uh, March Madness. Uh, they'll be they'll be part of the uh, show, of course, and, and may make it to the Final Four, but I did think they got tougher ahead of them. Well, you've said many times on our, our Razorcast, which we do on Thursday, which is all things Xavier basketball, and we cover the Big East there, that, that this is the spot. But before they get that, they do have to play – at home against Creighton and Seton Hall this week, getting a little ahead of ourselves with well, that spot. I'm sure we'll talk about, and that to me is one of the in- intriguing ones: is Seton Hall going into Philadelphia on uh, Sunday after that, that game against Creighton. Um, but yeah, you've said many times that you thought uh, the winner in the Big East was going to have three or four losses. Uh, before they won it, and uh, a couple of teams are going to have to get on Villanova, and, and they are weak. But a couple other games that uh, lurk in that are, are interesting this week. You know, tomorrow night Houston comes to Cincinnati, uh, and Houston's sort of lurking just outside the top 25, and they beat Wichita State. So that could be an interesting one for the AAC, which Cincinnati kind of has control of, and they are uh, very quietly in the top. 10, but Houston's done that. And then Texas goes to Texas Tech on Wednesday, and then Texas Tech has to turn around and go to TCU, so kind of a uh, square dance there in Texas. And I think Shaka Smart's getting Texas to speak a little, little schizophrenic like Alabama is because Alabama is going to go to Florida, uh, which is now number 23. And, and, you know, so Alabama, you know, they, they can beat Auburn and Oklahoma, but they lose by 12 to Ole Miss, which is only at 10 and 9. And uh, like you mentioned, Kansas State, unfortunately, fell to Kansas, but now they are still lurking just outside the top 25, and they're going to go to West Virginia, which is a little wounded right now, on Saturday. And and that could be uh, some interesting matchups that I'll throw out at you. And before we get to that, I'll make one correction. I've been saying February 5th for that Purdue-Michigan State matchup. It's actually February 10th, so we'll be talking about that next week. Okay. But any yeah, thoughts on some of those possible upsets there? Um, well, yeah, I, I agree with almost everything you said. Yeah, uh, shout out to the university, your Bearcats, the University of Cincinnati, who uh, have quietly uh, taken the lead in the AAC and have moved up to number eight in the national polls. And they only have two losses, and of course, uh, one of those was uh, on Xavier's home floor. And the other one was a turnaround game where they had to fly to New York to play the Florida Gators and lost that. So, yeah, they've quietly crept up into the top ten, and I think they're a force to be reckoned with. Uh, yeah, and that Houston team upset Wichita State. Uh, and uh, looking down the road, the Bearcats are going to have to play the Shockers twice uh, in February. Uh, very, very quick turnaround there. I think those games are only like uh, maybe a week or two apart. Uh, yeah, Shaka Smart, a uh, very young team. I think it's it's Mo Bamba I've heard you speak about uh, at Texas, who was uh, the big freshman. And that, that's the point I want to make. I think Texas and Alabama are kind of in the same boat in that they have uh, very talented freshmen who are leading them. Of course, that kind of leads to the schizophrenia, schizophrenia, like with Trey Young at Oklahoma. Sometimes they don't play all that well uh, being freshmen and have their ups and downs, and that leads to those teams sometimes losing games that maybe you thought they were going to win. In fact, I was just reading an article. I don't remember what it was, what uh, site, but uh, if you were a college coach going into Matt March Madness, would you want a bunch of talented one and dunners or a team that has a bunch of three- and four-year players with a lot of experience? And, of course, the, uh, the, guy, the author came to the conclusion that, well, you're going to – you're going to recruit the best players in the beginning, and you don't know who's going to really be the one and dunners. You have an idea, but uh, sometimes players don't pan out and they stay longer than you think they're going to stay. Or, and it is in the Trey Young uh, case, uh, nobody really had him pick to be a NBA top 20 draft to pick uh, when the season started, but now I think most people say he's probably going to be in the top 10. So uh, I guess the article, the, the point was that you can't really decide and you, you're going to take whatever you have uh, you're going to recruit the best players and take whatever you have to the uh, the big dance in March. Well, I mean, the old saw is you can't teach speed, you can't teach height, but you can teach experience. Uh, I think it, usually it's a mix. You get that lightning in the bottle, 
and you just never know. Nobody expected Grayson Allen to come back this year. Nobody expected McCall Bridges at MSU to come back, and they did, and they're at the top of, of their programs, and they're going to be there. Uh, but you, you just never know what's going to go. But we've, we've talked about this plenty. When it comes down to getting to those last phases of the tournament, you've got to have some sort of veteran leadership there, and that's what's helped teams like North Carolina and Villanova in, in the past few years, and that might be what helps Tony Bennett in, in Virginia this year. But you all, we also know that these games can turn on one cold night or one hot night, uh, and we're still you know six six weeks away from it even going on. So there's a lot of learning and experience to be had between the end of the season and all the conference tournaments that they have to have, which will tell us something, as you've often said, you know, having to be in that situation, whether it's a pre-season tournament or the actual tournament where you don't have two or three days off or you don't have four days off or you've got to turn right around and play the next day and then the next day or two days later, uh, that's what's going to teach us a lot going into March Madness. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's a chemistry thing, too. Just you talk about North Carolina, you know, uh, their starting lineup is not that much different than last year's starting lineup. They still got Joel Berry, who many consider their best player. But look at where their season has gone. They're sitting at 16-6 and six right now, and this is a defending national champion that uh, you probably know better since that's a conference, but they didn't lose a whole lot from that team, and a lot of people expected them to be, I think, preseason. They were at least in the top five, and uh, just no chemistry. Something's a little bit different there, and they haven't had the success uh, that they had last year. So, again, sometimes I think it might be a player or two that uh, makes a team, you know, the chemistry work. And and a point about uh, West Virginia, what I figured out about them, is uh, they play that pressure defense. And I think going into the later in the season, teams have realized you got to deal with that pressure and figure out how to get the ball up the court. Because if you can get the ball up the court against them, you do uh, a couple things. Obviously, you give yourself a chance to score, but you take away their chance to score because their major scoring runs come off of steals out of that pressure defense, and if you take your time and you attack it and you don't give them those steals, it kind of stymies them because they don't have a great half-court offense as, uh, you know, I hate to say it and bash on him, but that's been kind of uh, Bob Huggins' teams wherever he's been. When he was with the UC Bearcats, kind of the same way. When he was out of Kansas State for a couple years, they were kind of the same way. That When that uh, pressure defense is going well, uh, they can really – put it to teams, but when teams take their time and figure out how to attack it, uh, it, it hurts the West Virginia Mountaineers, and I think it's led a lot to their uh, late season slide here. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that, and just a couple of thoughts here. You know, North Carolina, one of the things that, yeah, there might be something a little off, but they've got that target on their back of national champs so everybody comes out and get them, and some of their losses, I mean, they've lost to Michigan State, they've lost to Florida State, uh, Virginia, Virginia Tech and North Carolina State, their only really ugly loss was to Wolford, which uh, came out of nowhere. Um, but uh, they'll, they'll be there at the end. It's just, but right, what, what's going to make it click? And uh, just, I agree with you with everything you say about Bob Huggins, but then you got to turn around and say that the only loss that Virginia has is against that pressure defense and, and Bob Huggins, West Virginia Mountaineers. So it's, uh, it's going to be a lot. A lot more basketball left. We're kind of at that low. Like I said, there's not a lot of huge games going on, which sets us up for upsets. Um, but as we get closer to the end, which will happen here in February, which will be the next time we talk to everybody, we'll be lining up for those conference championships, and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Um, but now, for now, for this week, why don't we move on to our, our closing segment of the Trivia and Tidbits. Uh, I got an easy one for you today. This is almost like uh, I'm almost embarrassed, but uh, now that, that 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 set me up for for crying. You say it's easy. If I get it wrong, then I look like a doofus. You know, so it better really be easy. Okay. Um, okay. We talked about Virginia a lot today, uh, and of course, uh, being here in Cincinnati, we're both uh, Xavier fans. What former Xavier coach went on to coach? the Virginia Cavaliers from 1998 to 2005? Well, that would be the Peter. 
Pete Gillen. Yeah. Yeah. He, now, he now, number, now number two on the Xavier all wins list behind Chris Mack. And of course he didn't have, uh, didn't really have much success, uh, at Virginia in his uh, seven years there. Of course, uh, in between squeezed in as when he was at uh, Providence College mm-hmm. right after he left Xavier. And then, uh, it, in my opinion, who would be, as we were actually not kids, but uh, a few years ago, uh, who was the three-time All-American that played for the Virginia Cavaliers, the seven-foot-four center? Ralphie. Ralphie Boyd. Hey, Ralph a Gentle Jeff. Giant, mm-hmm. who uh, came up with a lot of expectations and, and did some great things there, and had a, a you know one of those guys came in with huge expectations and took them to the NCAA's and uh, just had a target on his back. Just a, a quick comment about Pete Gilfill. I mean, he's one of the, the coaches that left for bigger pastures, not necessarily greener ones, because uh, that's when. Xavier was in the MCC, and they felt that they just uh, might need a bigger challenge. Like I say, he went to the original Big East with Providence and then to Virginia. And, yeah, he didn't have the success he had at Xavier, but he still won almost 56% of his games, but his downfall was just couldn't win in the ACC. He never did when they only had two winning records in the ACC and only won 20-win season. But he took them to – to the postseason five times. Unfortunately, only one of those was the NCAAs. And Ralph Sampson, just a, a legend, um, you know, whether it was I remember watching the game where he uh, blocked a shot that was – you couldn't have put it any higher off of the backboard, and yet he still got to it. Um, uh, and of course, it, he had to put his hand on the backboard to do it, and the, the replay, of course, it's illegal now – but the uh, replay showed that his hand was uh, almost two feet above the rim where he touched it, and that was a, and that hand was actually almost below his shoulder. That's how high he could get up, and he was a very powerful man. Could dribble, did a, did a lot of different things. Um, you know, not only was a three-time All-American, but three-time College Player of the Year. So a lot of neat things to, for Al Sampson doesn't quite get his due because injury kind of limited his NBA career, but fantastic, fantastic player, no doubt about it. And his number 50 hangs from the rafters there in Charlottesville. Okay, good stuff. Good stuff there on Well, on well and, 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 the, and the other reason I don't think he gets his due is because uh, when he was there, Virginia was expected to at least be Final Four national champions, and they never quite accomplished that. And of course, that... Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of tarnishes his uh, legend. But, yeah, again, having seen him play, of course, he, as you said, uh, seven foot four, but very athletic. Uh, and uh, I remember, I believe, the North Carolina State Wolfpack, when you watch that 30 for 30, they had to play him four times that year. They mm-hmm. met him in, uh, twice in the regular season, once in the uh, ACC championship, and then again, I think in the, I think it was a regional final they actually played him again before North Carolina State made it to the Final Four. Mm-hmm. Well, and uh, he did get one Final Four appearance in, in 81 and an Elite Eight in, in 83, but like I say, they just, so many expectations coming into University of Virginia, and uh, he still does a, a, a lot of things. He was coaching in the NBA as recently as 2013 with big men with the Phoenix Suns. So we will uh, move on from that and say – Keep going, Ralph. He's actually okay. I mean, he's he's my age, just born about a month before me in 1960. Um, going on to some trivia tidbits based upon you know the, the unfortunate incidences, we will we'll shine a little light on the women today in the women's NCAA championship. We go there every once in a while. Their first tournament wasn't until 1982, whereas the men's first tournament was in 1939. And a lot of that was due to the institution of the Title IX programs, which demand equity in athletics at the college level. First champion was, uh, I won't even ask you, Jim, because I'm sure if you want to throw out an answer before I get to it, go ahead. Louisiana Tech. You are correct. It oh. was Louisiana Tech under Sonia Hogg. They defeated 
Cheney College, who was under the great Vivian Stringer, who's now the Rutgers coach, and also took them to a runner-up finish in 2007. First Actually, team to repeat. Vivian Stringer has taken four different teams to the Final Four. Mm-hmm. I just read. I just read a uh, biography on her. A no, great uh, pioneer in uh, women's college basketball. In fact, interesting story. In high school, for the first two years, because she was uh, obviously was the late seventies, I think Title IX and all that. She was a cheerleader. She didn't. They didn't even have uh, a girls' basketball team. It came about, I think, her last year or two in high school. But went on for a mm-hmm. storied uh, college career. Played at uh, some small school out east, I believe. And then again, yeah, she's taken four different teams to the women's final four. Mm-hmm. Well, three, three because she's only coached three teams. I don't know where it's. Uh, she's only been to Cheney State, Iowa, and Rutgers. I don't know, we'll have to double check our that there. But she has taken the Vivian Stringer, fantastic coach there. First team to repeat was the University of Southern California, who kept Louisiana Tech from going back-to-back in the second tournament, and they won in 83 and 84. They were led by the great Cheryl Miller. Fifteen different programs have won titles over the ensuing 35 years. University of Connecticut under the great Gina Oriyama has 11 of those, followed by Tennessee, which has eight under the great Pat Summit. Everybody else as repeated, has two, and that's Baylor, Louisiana Tech, Stanford, and Southern California. And the defending champ, as we talked about a, a couple of weeks ago, is Southern South Carolina under Don Staley. So lots of thanks. We thank you for listening today. This has been your weekly trialcast. We'll be back next Tuesday with all things NCAA basketball. And, of course, join us on Thursdays as well where Jim and I talk about Xavier basketball and a lot about the Big East on our weekly Razor cast. Anything to add before we sign off this week, Jim? Well, and uh, just uh, as you bring that up about women, I, I just heard Thursday uh, the number one uh, UConn uh, Huskies go to the na- defending national champion South Carolina Gamecocks for a big matchup in women's basketball on Thursday if you want to watch a little very good women's basketball. It's, it's very, very good basketball. Uh, No doubt about it. Different game, but very, very good basketball. All right, so thank you all for listening. We will talk to you next Tuesday, our first show of February.